Yo guys, what is up? Here we are with another reading video, and today we are starting a new book, as you can probably tell by the title of the video, and it is The Boys Who Challenged Hitler, Nud Peterson and the Churchill Club by Philip Hoos. Uh, so it's a really good book, and it was I already had it, so it was free, so that was that was really good. And so without any further ado, let's get right into it. If you really hate this book, please just let me know in the comments below what you want me to read instead. But I think you guys will really enjoy this book. It's one of my favorite books. I've read it, oh god, so many times. So I hope you guys enjoy. Chapter 1. Oprah. April 9th, 1940. It was a breakfast like any, like any other until the dishes started to rattle. Then an all-alert siren piece pierced the morning calm in the sky above Odin's Denmark thundered with sound. <coughs> Excuse me. The Pendersen family pushed back their chairs, raced outside, and looked up. Suspended above them in close formation was a squadron of dark airplanes. They were flying ominously slow, no more than 300 meters above the ground. The black marks on each wing tagged them as German warplanes. Scraps of green papers fluttered down. Nud Peterson, 14, stepped outside and plucked one from the lawn. Oprah, it began, slightly misspelled, that meant something like attention in Danish. Though the leaf through the leaflet addressed to Danish soldiers and Danish people was written in an error filled garble of German, Danish, and Norwegian. The point was unmistakable. German military forces had invaded Denmark and was now occupying the country. The leaflet explained that they had arrived to protect Danes from the sinister England and French. That Den Denmark had become a protectorate of Germany. So there's no need to worry. Everyone was protected now. Danes should go on with their lives as usual. Nud Peterson looked around at his neighbors. Some stolen pajamas appeared dazed. Others were furious. Across the st street, a father and his two sons stood at rigid attention on their apartment balcony, ar right arms thrust reverently t upward towards the German airplanes. Mr. Anderson, the merchant who sold Tarzan comics from his coist in the corner, was shaking his fist at the sky. All four neighbors would be dead within three years. The following day, Denmark's Prime Minister, Thorold Stein, and Danish King Christian X put their signature to an agreement allowing Germany to occupy Denmark and take control of the government. A terse proclamation explained Denmark's official position. The government has acted in the honest conviction that in doing so we have saved the country from an even worse fate. It will be our continued endeavor to protect our country and its people from the disasters of war. We shall rely on the people's cooperation. All day long, German soldiers poured into Odense and other cities by boat, plane, tank, and transport wagon. Ordinary German foot soldiers of the German Defense Force, the Wurzfront, wore brownish green uniforms. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Jeez. Okay. Wore brownish, brownish green uniforms with black hobnail boots and rounded green helmets. Well prepared, they quickly took over the town, setting up barracks, command centers, and hotels, factories, and schools. They pounded Germanish la German language directional signs into public squares and strung miles of telephone lines between headquarters, operation centers, and barracks. By the end of the day, there were 16,000 Germans on Danish soil, and Germany was, to was in total control. Operation Wurzelsbank Just after dawn on April 9, 1940, a merchant ship that normally carried coal sailed by Danish security forces and docked at Langling Pier in Copenhagen. Like the Trojan horse of Greek mythology, it carried a secret. Hatches opened and German soldiers poured from the hole, fanning out through the city, seizing... seizing control of key installations. In the same moment, German forces were invading other Danish cities, pouring in by air, sea, rail, and even e and even to secure a strategically important airport in the key city of Al Alborg, paratrooper. This well-coordinated invasion, which also targeted Norway, had the German code name Wurzelsberg after the after the Wurzelsberger in northern Germany. It was over by noon. Danish forces were stunned and overwhelmed. When darkness fell, the Wurzelsberg took to the streets of Denmark to explore their new homes. In Odense, Denmark's third largest city, many Danish merchants were delighted to open taps of beer or sell pastries to German troops. In fact, the huge new market seemed a windfall. German soldiers pushed into Odense theaters, taverns, bakeries, and cafes. In the evenings, the German, 
the worshipment's shoulders marched arm in arm through Odin's streets. Weapons strapped to their shoulders, bellowing folk songs in unison as onlooking Danes cocked their heads in curiosity. Nod Peterson watched from the crowd. The commander would shout, Three, four, and they would all begin to sing. Some songs were romantic ballads, other military marches. Either way, they looked ridiculous. They actually seemed to believe that we liked them. They behaved as if we wanted them there, and as if we had been waiting for them, like we were grateful to them. A tall, slender, Nud Peterson had known and cared little about war politics until that Friday morning in April. He was a reasonably good student and handy with his fists, as you had to be at his all-boys school, but Nud's real love was drawing and painting. Each Saturday morning, he met his favorite cousin, Han Jorgen Anderson, at the Odin's Library. They went straight for the big volumes of art history, flipped to the breathtaking nudes of Rubens or to Greek sculptures of the female figure, and started drawing. To Nud and Hans Jorgen, the half-draped Venus de Milo was a hundred times more interesting than the fully clothed Mona Lisa. On Sundays, after Nud's father, the Reverend Edward Peterson, completed his Protestant church service, the Peterson family would convene in the church residency with aunts, uncles, and cousins from other branches, forming a great tribe. In the office, uncles drank and swore their way through a fast-moving, table-slamming card game called the Hombre. Nud's mother, Margaret, and his many aunts occupied the sitting room, knitting, sipping tea, and talking nonstop, getting up now and then to tend the slow-cooking chickens whose aroma grew stronger from the kitchen by the minute. Children, including Nud, his brother Jens, a year older, his sister Gertrude, two years younger, and his much younger brother, Jorgen and Holger, played on the second f- floor, creating and painting scenery for the evening performance of Robin Hood or Snow White or Robin Sin Cruz, Crusoe. Each child got to invite a friend. By evening, there were dozens of laughing, drinking, applauding friends and family, full, of, full and satisfied. It was like growing up in a cocoon. Not had only had been only dimly aware that Germany had invaded Poland the year before, he was oblivious to the special peril that Jews faced with Hitler in control. Before his planes arrived in April 9th, Germany had seemed no more than the neighborhood bully, a bordering country with 20 times Denmark's population and an undue influence on Danish history and culture. Even before the war, Danish students had to study German at school, learn German literature, and play German music. Adolf Hitler had not seemed particularly a particular menace either. In 1937, the fourth year of Hitler's Nazi regime, the Peterson family had gone on a motor tour of Germany in the family's big green Nash Rambler. As they rolled through the neatly cropped pastures and well-managed towns, Nud's parents expressed admiration for what Hitler had accomplished. There was a sense of order and industry in the small towns and cities. Germans were at work while many other nations were still mirrored in a worldwide economic depression. At the end of the trip, their father had pinned a small flag with a swastika, to the windshield of the car. When they re- re-entered Denmark, Danes in the border villages, neighbors who knew the Nazis well, suggested they remove it at once. But now all this innocence was gone. A bubble popped. German forces had also stormed into Norway on April 9th, but Norway had fought back, standing up to the mighty German war machine and paying with a he- heavy loss of life. In those early days after the German invasion, there were sickening news accounts of, G- of Norwegian soldiers slaughtered in defense of their nation. Many were boys in their late teens. Invasion of Norway. The German the German attack on Norway on April 9, 1940, brought war to Norway for the first time in 126 years. Nearly 50,000 Norwegian troops were mobilized, but they were overmatched by the German forces. Germans quickly seized control of coastal cities and then, deploying troops especially trained for mountain warfare, went after Norwegian soldiers into the in the country's rugged interior. Norway had out for two months, hoping for support from Great Britain that turned out to be too little and too late. Norway surrendered two months of fight after two months of fighting, which had left 1,335 Norwegians killed or wounded. Norwegians keep, kept fighting at sea, employing their large fleet of merchant ships to transport goods to nations at war with Germany. Germany wiped out 106 of 121 Norwegian vessels, killing thousands. Only one of Norwegian's nine Norway's nine subways survived the war. Submarines. Not subways. Meanwhile, Danish school children were being peppered with the Nazi propaganda describing the glorious future awaiting them. Nud Peterson. I was in 8th grade when the Germans came. We're, we had about two months of school remaining until summer recess. The occupation was on everybody's 
everyone's mind, but during those weeks our teachers kept telling us not to talk about it. Don't object, don't mouth off, we mustn't arouse the giant. There were many German sympathizers on our school faculty. In Denmark, our second language is German, and our book suddenly sprouted all these articles about the happy Hitler youth who went out in the sunshine and camped and hiked through the forest and played in the mountains and got to visit old castles and all that bloody garbage. It was easy to see that it was all crap. And that is the end of chapter one. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, make sure to leave a big thumbs up, comment down below, and don't forget, hit that subscribe button. I'll see you guys in the next video.